What's up, Roto B? All right, Dave. We are talking Dynasty Orphans tonight, man. Uh, I'm so excited that I hit the I hit the I hit the music early, Curtis. It's all good, man. It's all good. Those myself. of you listening on the Cut radio. Yeah, you're listening on the radio. It's Curtis and Dave on the Root of His Fantasy Football Podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, you are just watching the mess here at the top of the show. But we're talking about one of my favorite topics and one that is growing on Dave over the past couple of years and his off-season dynasty. And specifically this show, we are going to talk about dynasty orphans. One of, the, one of the great things about the dynasty ecosystem is if you are a, you know, you're a dedicated you know, year in, year out, just dynasty die hard. You know, there are there are teams that need some loving. And there are there are owners that draft too many teams, take on just a few, uh, a few too many, and they they have to part with some of them, or maybe they can't afford their buy-ins the next year. Any any number of reasons why they might uh give up a team for adoption. But over at myffpc.com, our partners in Dynasty, you know, hosting our Rotoviz Triflex Leagues. They've never had a dynasty league fold. And part of that is because they're very efficient at placing orphans and selling them. And so you can actually go to their website, myffpc.com right now. And if you click over on dynasty, you will see a bunch of orphan teams in their lobby uh, for sale. Some of them are marked at full price because they've got nice assets and it'd be a good team to manage. Some of them are marked down to a single dollar for the first year buy-in. So I would encourage you, if you're listening to the show and you end up liking this topic, go over there and check out some of those orphans on your own. Uh, one thing that's interesting for our listeners uh, and our Rotoviz subscribers is, you know, we know that eh, when about 90% of those orphans are placed, that's when FFPC is going to open up the startup draft for this year. So you adopting an orphan also helps us all draft new startup teams more <laughs> quickly, uh, which is great. The other place that you can adopt an orphan if you decide that you want to do this after listening to this episode is uh via the dynasty depot and that's dynastydepot.com they are also partnered with ffpc and this is really just a storehouse for orphans but it's a little different situation so orphans there are orphans that people are drafting with the idea of selling them so you're going to have some more uh juicy looking rosters over there but you're probably going to pay a little bit more than a typical annual buy-in because some of these teams are monsters. So you can check that out if you want uh, over at dynastydepot.com. Okay, that's enough about that. Dave, we're going to yes. talk about Dynasty Orphans tonight because we just adopted one, man. We're not just sitting the here. Proud parents. Yeah, yes, we just <laughs> we are proud parents of a new Dynasty roster. And uh, before we break it down and talk about the moves that we want to make, um, you know, this isn't your first time looking at, at orphans. It might be the first orphan we've adopted together. I think it is. Yes. So before I answer, and you know that I'm going to want to, what do you look for in an orphan dynasty team? All right. Well, first and foremost, to be honest, I look for just players that I think are fun players that are exciting to have so that I get, you know, excited about taking on and adopting this team. Uh, from there, I'm also looking at the general makeup and the roster construction of that team. So does it have a path that I see forward working into the way that I like to play Dynasty or the way that I'm looking to uh, structure this roster? So lots of times that comes with quickly trying to hone in on what is the weakness or the thing that needs to be improved in this team? What is the base strength of this team that I can carry forward? If I feel like I can identify that and I positioned myself for success, then that's certainly a team that I'm looking to go and uh, acquire. Now, perhaps if you wanted to give more of a challenge and kind of take a team that you're not feeling, you know, like that there's that clear path, it's generally, I think, uh, a practice of mine to try and find at least the one or two players that even if you're not planning on keeping them on that roster, that are the chips you're going to start to work with. Uh, so it really just comes down to finding some type of plan or the way that this team fits into the way that you think that you like to play dynasty or that you want to play dynasty with that team. But the final thing, again, for me, a lot of times it's just finding about a player or two that kind of get me excited. Maybe I don't have them on any of my other teams or I just really love them. And I think we might have a couple of those guys on this team. Yeah, we, we probably will. Um, 
So, yeah, I, th- I think that's a good answer. I mean, finding, you know, finding a construct or finding a combination of players that you're comfortable with, that's going to that's going to really help you hit fast forward in, in the in the building process because you're going to be able to make familiar moves. So yeah. in, in the context of your whole dynasty portfolio, if this team is already kind of sort of similar to other teams you're managing, obviously, then, you know, that's going to be less work. However, it's not that's not necessarily going to challenge you as much as a dynasty manager. And oftentimes those people that are going after orphans, they're doing it because they're like ready for that next challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say that that part of it might be a little overrated. Don't bite off more than you can chew with an orphan because some of the rebuilds can be pretty, pretty daunting. Yeah. But if you are if you are patient uh, and you're willing to watch these lobbies, you can find some teams that are desirable lumps of clay that you know you can turn into a masterpiece. And so what what I really look for in an orphan uh, is you've, you've just got to have desirable assets. At this point, it's January. I don't care about team construct. I don't care what position uh, all of the, the talent is concentrated in. I'm just looking for a team that didn't get abandoned simply because it's all old. You know, a, a team that was totally neglected and also is devoid of, of you know, future rookie picks. That's, that's tough. You got to have one or the other. You can adopt an all old team and make a couple moves and try to make your, you know, your first buy-in back that first year, make the playoffs, sneak in, whatever, as long as you've got some future draft capital. Or if it's a team that's basically got, you know, nothing going for it and you're patient, but they've got, you know, hey, two firsts this year and an extra second and you know, two firsts next year. It's a team that just, you know, sold off to the the playoff teams or something. You can work around that too. And then there's the there's obviously the balanced option too, where those teams typically will have, you know, two or three nice young pieces, maybe some older players that the manager couldn't get rid of. And they still have some draft picks too. That's my favorite type of orphan to adopt because when you're entering a league, having adopted an orphan, you never know what the ecosystem of that league is. Do the other managers trade a lot? Um, Are there only one or two really active managers that are willing to trade at like reasonable market prices? Um, You don't know that until you join the league. And so having a team that could go a, a couple different directions, maybe you're... Maybe it's going to be easier for you to buy age and win that first title. Maybe it's going to be easier for you to sell your age, uh, even if it's at a discount because you've got you know a guy on top that's trying to stay on top. You just won't know till you have the roster. So I'm looking for balance and in absence of balance, I want a lot of picks or a lot of youth. Um, yeah, any thoughts on that? I've got one other question I wanted to go like high level uh, with you on before we talk about our roster. No, I was just going to say I think that uh, you know what you said there all makes complete sense. And that's the other thing that is fun about going an orphan is you can kind of pick to that challenge yeah. that you want. And like you said, yeah. if you pay attention and you watch, you are going to find some teams that are actually very well positioned. Uh, but for whatever reason that, you know, manager had to move on. All right. I've got another question for you, Dave. What, what do you think? I mean, I guess I should have asked you this before we adopted this team together, but I'm going to yes. ask you after the fact now, what is a realistic performance expectation? after adopting an orphan well that probably depends on the context of the team right just in general in a vacuum you've in adopted a vacuum an all right if so you adopt an orphan yeah so i i think that for your first year you really should think that you can improve that team maybe up three or four spots in the in the rankings at the end of the year i don't know what that translates translates to in terms of games or some type of point per game number but i do think that if you finished in the you know, bottom four of your league, you you definitely can make the moves that you need to to get back into, you know, closer being towards the top half. Okay, I'm going to rephrase the question because that, All so right. I think improvement, I think improvement would be everyone's expectation. What is your expectation of um, having a profitable team? What's your timeline? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I think... I'm expecting, honestly, uh, if I'm taking like a middle of the road team, I'm expecting that by the second year in, you know, I'm probably getting towards the chance where I realistically win a cash, be that coming in third, you know, or better. Yeah. But yeah. I, I like that. Your, your two, I think, is a realistic performance expectation. But again, you never know what type of that, that's assuming that you can make some trades in the league that you join. Yep. Um, sure. If you, if you end up, joining in an unfortunate league where 
you know, it's difficult to create trade relationships. It's it's going to push out another year because you never know, you know, what kind of draft picks uh, you've got in there. And it might take a couple of rookie drafts for you to have the right combination of players. But it, if you can't look at a roster and say, hey, you know what, by year two, I could cash with this team. In, unless you're a really talented dynasty manager, I would caution you from from adopting that type of team. Unless, and this is why FFPC doesn't have league fold, uh, leagues fold unless it's a deeply discounted team because you know you don't want to be paying full buy-ins and then really not have any prayer of competing until year three mm -hmm. but i mean some of these teams that are in bad shape you know they might only cost 10 percent of first year buy-in sometimes even less than that i mean then yeah. you're getting free year so that so then it, i mean if you got a free year then okay well then i'm looking at year three now yeah. so uh i guess i should should have qualified it there all right, all right let's hit a drop and then let's talk about our experience in the lobby and the team we ended up adopting all right dave so we talked at the top of the show about the process of uh adopting an orphan over at ffpc.com and before the show tonight in pre-production you know, we were talking about different ideas we had talked about running down you know maybe one of the teams that we're already managing and then we were looking at the lobby and then it just became apparent like this would be way more interesting to talk about adopting an orphan and we very quickly talked ourselves into adding a team to our portfolio as, and, as we should have known yeah, yeah. i mean that was, it was going to happen uh it was going to happen we're going to get juiced up talking about this topic so um you know when when you go in there if you're listening to the road of his fantasy football podcast or watching this on youtube i mean I, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at the road of his triflex orphans um, that is going to be the format that, you know, Sean and I do our dynasty rankings based off of, and it's, it's a more familiar format for a Rotoviz type player. It's a little bit more wide receiver heavy. It's not the older school FFPC leagues where, you know, running backs are still King, you know, it's a, it's a mandatory start three wide receiver situation, and it's a super flex league along with tight end premium. It's the modern version of dynasty, no kickers, no defense, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Dave and I are looking down through this list. There's orphans listed from a dollar all the way up to twelve hundred and fifty dollars on the uh, on, in the lobby right now, and we came across a team that kind of hit the intersect of what Dave and I both said we look for in a dynasty team. So if you're if you're able to follow along on your screen, great. If not, you maybe grab a piece of paper and think about some of these assets, Dave. Because I'm going to run down this team, and then we can we can talk about our expectations for it in year one. And then maybe, you know, hey, what's the first type of move each one of us would like to make? I think that's a practical application point for the listeners. Yep. So at quarterback on this team, we're starting out with Jalen Hurts and Kyler Murray. I had to. I mean, I'm, I'm going to want to do it for nearly half of this list, but I'll hold off now. Yeah. So Jalen Hurts and Kyler Murray. And then, you know, there's depth at the position with Josh Dobbs and, and Mac Jones. Not sure that we'll have anything with either of those players yet. I mean, Mac will probably stick around in the league on draft capital. You know, Josh Dobbs is probably going to end up being a, a, a cut casualty on this roster. But I mean, starting your team with Jalen Hurts and Kyler Murray, knowing you won't have to do anything at quarterback uh, and you can kind of relax, it's going to allow us to focus our rebuild efforts at fewer positions. And it will reduce some of the stress of, of taking on this orphan. So this was one that really jumped out to us just because of those two guys as we were scrolling through the lobby. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's my turn to talk here. So Jameer <laughs> Gibbs. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I believe that's who stood out to us, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So you got Jameer Gibbs as our anchor here at running back. Uh, which obviously we're very excited about. We did have a little bit of the discussion of I was wondering if we could use Gibbs as a conduit to improve this team by jettisoning him, jettisoning him. Well, I'm having trouble talking tonight, Curtis. I'm so excited about this team. We'll come back to thinking about that more, but he's followed by James Conner at running back. This team also has J.K. Dobbins, Ezekiel Elliott, Chase Edmonds, Samaj P. Ryan, Kareem Hunt, and Austin Eckler. Uh, you know, an aging running back there. So an interesting base of players. Uh, but I also left out another name here, which is kind of interesting that he's going to be in the flex. Yeah. So yeah, David Montgomery, the other name in the in the running back stable there. So again, at this position, I think we're in a spot where e even though you would like to have some more youth, 
uh, and some more upside from this group, knowing that we've got Jameer Gibbs as an anchor. And my, I mean, it's the same backfield, but you know, we saw them both be producers. I mean, at least with Gibbs and Montgomery, you feel good about having two usable players. We're, we're, we're not going to try to build this team around running back anyway, but the combination of James Conner and Austin Eckler, I mean, maybe you get a, a Franken veteran running back out of that next year. We know we expect Jim Harbaugh to be a run heavy offense in, uh, in LA. Who knows if Eckler will still be there or what type of role he will have, but James Conner actually looks fantastic again this year. So, you know, probably we can use one of them or, you know, maybe we're able to construct a trade where, you know, one of those guys goes bye-bye. At the wide receiver position, this is where we're, we're going to want to focus our work, but we love doing work on wide receivers. So uh, Devontae Smith is is probably the cream of the crop there. Uh, we've actually got a pair of Buccaneers uh, wide receivers in Chris Godwin and Mike Evans. And then DeAndre Hopkins rounds out this wide receiver depth chart. So that is a concern that we're going to want to talk about as we position ourselves for moves. It's mandatory start three wide receiver uh, in road of his triflex league. And we only have four wide receivers and two of them are over the age of 30. So that's an immediate point. We can talk about our draft capital. We can talk about trades. Um, but hey, if we're starting off with four and you feel pretty good about having three that you can start, uh, assuming that, you know, maybe one of Evans or Hopkins doesn't totally fall off the map in 2024. You know, it, it's workable, right? We've got some options here. That's all we're really looking for. We are excited about the tight end, Dave. Yeah, we we definitely are. This was one of the things that really brought us around to settling on this being a team that we wanted to uh, add to our portfolio of teams. And that's because they have two young tight ends in Trey McBride and Dalton Schultz. Both have looked really good. And McBride, I mean, just an exceptional, exceptional year last year. So it feels really nice to now have the youth at that position and to some degree kind of being able to go on autopilot there, at least in the near future. Uh, but we should be able to use this duo for quite a while. And the other aspect that we thought was pretty neat about this pairing here is that, yes, we are a bit weaker in wide receiver, but we are comfortable with one of these guys starting the year uh, in the flex for us, if need be. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And we, we've also got Brevin Jordan here. And I, I, that's not like a big name right now, but, yep. you know, he has flashed some big play ability. And we know that the Texans offense is, you know, definitely on the rise. CJ Stroud is on the rise. So if, if Jordan does stick there in Houston, I mean, you know, who knows? If, if Dalton Schultz were to go down, you know, maybe Jordan um, finds a way to be a significant contributor. He'll probably be on that cut line for us on this team. But, you know, you never know. We'll have to see how that develops. Now, um, the other thing that we can look at here, uh, and I'm going to stop sharing the screen just for a second, Dave, as I uh, pull up the draft picks on the team, because that's the other thing sure. that we've got to look at before we start talking about the potential, you know, next set of moves that we would want to make. All right, I can pull this back in now. So we've got uh, the 111 this year. And then we don't have another pick until the fifth round. So you know, this team does have some strength. I'll have to go back through and look through the transaction log that we've inherited after adopting this squad. I'm curious what happened as uh, we traded away the two, three, and four picks here. But you know, we'll have to work around that. At 111, you know, we should be able to draft a wide receiver. Again, this is a super flex <clears throat> setup here. So we may be able to get something like the wide receiver four uh, or maybe even the wide receiver three in this year's class, depending on, you know, how the, the managers in this league like to draft. The other thing that we liked about this squad is even though there's no 2025 second, there are two 2025 firsts. So that's going to give us some optionality here. Um, you know, one, we could opt to just, see how this team does with some of the age that it has run these draft picks straight up knowing that we've got a little bit of extra high-end draft capital two years from now and you know if we hit on that 111 we might not need to do much to this team uh for it to perform well this year in the in the ffpc rookie drafts veterans are also available after the rookies uh along with the rookies yeah so we might be able to you know hit on a some sort of you know mid-career sleepers at those five six seven uh, picks in 
the 2024 uh, rookie slash uh, free agent draft here. But, you know, more likely, you know, we can consider, okay, do we want to, you know, move back down to the second round in the 2025? And what could we do if we paired one of those picks to move down around with some of these aging players that we have? Would we just want to trade all the way out of the 2024 draft knowing that we're already kind of a little bit capital poor uh this year anyway so it's going to be really fun over the next week to kind of think about some of those things i think what we should do here for the last segment of the show let's hit a drop and let's each talk about maybe our main one or two priorities for this team in the first week of ownership All right, Dave. Um, so we've we've run the roster down and we've run the, the picks down and we've talked a little bit about what we look for in an orphan, what our expectations are after adopting an orphan. You know, now we've actually got the actual orphan. So having looked at this team, what would maybe your main priority be for this first week that we're sharing uh, ownership of the team? And then do you have a suggestion for maybe how we would achieve that goal? <laughs> Yeah, so the, the first place that I would want to start is identifying the pieces on this team that we both feel comfortable in using to uh, make trades with to better this team. Um, you know, I'm looking at this list of wide receivers, and I think that one of the challenges might be a couple of the players that I would want to unload are at the wide receiver position, which is the position that we need to try to improve. So I'm not sure if that comes down to trying to move one of the older veterans, somebody like Mike Evans for two younger pieces that maybe aren't valued that highly right now. But I think before we could really start having those conversations, it's identifying which pieces we both feel good about moving and then also determining what we feel about those 2025 draft picks, what we know about that class right now and how we're feeling about the class that's going to be coming in this year because those are the type of things that you needed to be thinking about when you uh, plan out your next couple of years with a team. Yeah, I, I agree that like in general, we would, we would probably be seeking to move off of Mike Evans and Deandre Hopkins. However, I would expect that managers in a road of his triflex league, they're going to have hey, yep. some reservations. They're going to have some reservations about taking those players on. And so I, I agree my biggest priority is addressing the wide receiver position because I want to go into this draft having some options. I don't want to feel like we have to, not, not that we ever would make a draft pick based off of team need because, again, team need in May when this rookie yeah. draft occurs is still months from the season. But, you know, let's just be real. Uh, any manager, no matter how great their process is, might feel some pressure uh, when reviewing their roster during a rookie draft. So if, if we can make this wide receiver depth chart a little bit more flexible it's not only does it give us options of what you know what name to call uh, at that 111 it gives us options of what we want to do with that pick yeah and so i think what i want to do i look at this roster and i see i see some intriguing running back names besides gibbs i think basically any running back besides gibbs that would have value would be a player that we could try to move for maybe a younger wide receiver that hasn't broken out the way that the manager would have quite hoped uh or you know maybe a, maybe a fifth older wide receiver even it, i'd rather have another older wide receiver than uh you know all of these old running backs on this team so at least that we had a little bit more depth so jk dobbins might appeal to the right manager for yep you know, uh, maybe another young kind of star crossed player, but just at a different position. Um, David Montgomery, certainly I think would have RB2 value, which should translate into, you know, wide receiver two, three value. And then, you know, even, even a player like Eckler, now maybe we could make it more attractive by packaging Eckler and DeAndre Hopkins and getting kind of two name brand values just for one player. Yep. You know, could, could we go get, you know, JSN, uh, or, you know, a, a player that should have done more that and just didn't, would we be able to buy maybe a disappointing year one rookie? And I, I'm just using that as an example. You know, you can fill in the blank with, the, you know, whatever player that you would like to fill in, but two name brand entities, could we get 
you know, a young, you know, one younger rookie that hasn't quite broken out yet. The other option that we would have to do something like that is to, you know, a team that doesn't have a tight end. Maybe we could pair one of those older players with Dalton Schultz, knowing that we feel great about McBride. I know, I know you like the depth that we have there, but I think in tight end premium, we can find our ways uh, around. You know, we can find our ways around a, a tight end two on the weeks when McBride isn't going to play. And we've also both been pretty good about identifying some situational tight ends that you know get into those fifty or sixty catch ranges. Yeah. Uh, kind of surprisingly each year i think we've both had a, a knack for that schultz actually was one of those players was one of those players yep. years ago, uh yep. back in dallas that we were able to identify so th that's what I, I agree i think wide receiver is the the play but there's a lot of different ways that we could go about um grabbing somebody so i think the next thing that we've got to do is look at some of these other rosters in this league figure out who we're compatible with and just start sending offers let's yeah. let's see what the value system is and you know, we'll come back and let people know if we've made a trade on this team, as we always do of you know any of our dynasty teams. But you know, let us know what you think. Do you like this type of episode where we're kind of walking through the process, uh, our thought process, and 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 applying it? Uh, you know, do you have any other suggestions for these types of episodes that you would like to see? It's the off season, baby, so we can get flexible uh, with some of these pods and some of these uh, YouTube videos way more flexible than we can be in the season when people are depending on us for projections and waiver pickups and and things like that. So uh, yeah, in summary, consider drafting a dynasty orphan. And if you're going to do it, do it at FF, myffpc.com. Dave, until next week, it's been the Rotoviz Fantasy Football Podcast.